Welcome to the Inspirational Insights Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the circular economy, the design of change, and and the archetypes that go with uh, emerging out of pandemic. Where do we go to from here? What is the emerging future that we can participate in designing? My name is Donna Jones. I'm your host. And today I'm extremely excited to have with us Cassinia Benefend. She is uh, currently working with the Forum for the Future as Senior Principal Change Designer in the Americas Division on the West Coast of, of North America. She's been in systems designing and social researching, tackling the big issues that some businesses have embraced full on and others are tinkering around the edges. Still others are trying desperately to get back to something called normal in the context of of a pandemic. I'm delighted to have her with me today. We're going to have a conversation about the here to there, what the opportunities are, drawing on Cassinia's incredible background. Cassinia, where do you want to begin? Thank you very much for having me here today. Maybe I'll just talk a little bit about where I'm coming from and how all these different disciplines come together. As you mentioned, I do social research. I'm a futurist and I'm a change designer. I've been working across different industries. I've worked with corporations. I've worked in the government for a little bit. I've worked in nonprofit and education. For me, I've been thinking, how do we take the futures thinking down on the ground level to apply it to social change? The four different ways that I use my um, training and my work is sharing narratives around the future, saying this is what the future would look like. Here's the different possibilities of a desired future. Another piece is translating it and making it more immersive. So really having people experience the different possibilities. And I've actually played with virtual reality to do that and also experiential futures. Bringing people together. So really making sure that you have different voices. Diversity is really key when you're thinking about what the opportunities could be when you're thinking about the future. Also, Being in the transition space where you go from here, this is where we are today, and then what would it take to get to a desired future? And so that's really thinking about what are the innovations that are necessary? Who needs to be part of this? How do we adopt some of these innovations and scale? What are some of the policies and business models and economic models that need to be shifted to get to a desired future that we're aiming for? One simple area to adapt is in our decision-making processes. I've been talking about the need to shift away from linear decision-making when we're in complex conditions to something that is more respectful of the interactions. People ask me, well, what exactly does that mean? You presented, back in 2015, information on linear decision-making that really made me think. 90% of the raw materials used in the manufacturing process becomes waste before the product even leaves the factory. After that, 80% of the products get thrown away within the first six months, ending up in incinerators, landfill, wastewater, a massive amount of waste. I think we can approach life differently. What's Mm -hmm. the state of the nation with respect to shifting from a linear economy where we're busy throwing everything out and counting it as GDP (laughs) to more of a circular economy where we're actually respecting all of the, the natural resources that we are using in our manufacturing and every other process? Where are we at? I'm seeing a lot more going on in Europe in terms of policy and not as much in terms of policy in North America. And I'm also seeing companies doing their individual work. So for instance, in France, they recently uh, released guidelines on ensuring that all the tech companies are able to provide for how their item breaks down. Friends began requiring makers of different electronic devices, such as cell phones and computers, to tell consumers how repairable that product is. They have a repairability index. And so now France is requiring that major companies are now disclosing that repairability. Because of course, part of the challenge is built-in obsolescence, and it becomes really challenging for consumers to even start repairing their products. We don't have that yet in the U.S. or Canada, from what I understand, but we do have companies who are taking their own initiative to uh, really think creatively and think about waste from one uh, industry as a net new input for their products. So to give an example, Adidas is thinking about how to use fishing nets 
or waste from oceans to actually create their new running shoes. Or they're also thinking about how to create a 100% recyclable shoe that's made to be remade. Once it's broken down, it can actually be returned and to create a brand new pair. Brands are actually doing it on their own. You also have some brands who are looking at fish products, like old fish scales, to start thinking how to integrate that into their products. It's really design and it's also being creative with the materials that you do have access to. Wonderful. Good to hear. I, I know I was just attending a Reuters conference recently and, and they were reporting on recycling of PCB plastics and so forth. And I think Brazil's got a 99% recycling rate on plastics and, and the United States has got a 30% recycling rate. And the difference between the two is cottage industry. Apparently, cottage industry in Brazil, they're turning that into a profit center for people on the street. That's remarkable. And it really speaks to the power of the consumer in this. And I know you've done some work on consumer engagement and consumer involvement. Where, where does the consumer lie? What's their potential role in supporting a shift from a future that, that has nothing but depleted resources in it to a trajectory that has a lot more hope in it? The role of consumers is huge because a lot of how we see consumption right now is going to change. Part of shifting to a circular economy is moving away from ownership of products to potentially leasing or renting things. It's about thinking how to increase the life cycle of a product, of repairing things when they're broken down or maintaining things and making sure that you're extending the life cycle of a product. The research that I did I looked at the different business models that are coming up as part of the circular economy transition. And then I looked at what are the behaviors that consumers will need to adopt? How will they need to change their current behaviors and how we approach the consumer culture? And what would that look like? And what are some of the opportunities and barriers in those behaviors? I really tested five different behaviors. One was repair because we're extending the life cycle of the product, borrowing instead of buying something new, uh, borrowing and leasing. And then there's swapping. There's more around swapping that's happening right now in the circular economy and buying items that are made out of recycled material. This is something that's post-consumer goods, fully 100% made out of recycled material. It was really interesting. I looked at drivers of behavior and the drivers included everything from are people motivated by their values or people motivated by financial savings or because they want to do good for the environment or is it something convenient through the research. And I, and I went out and I did interviews and I also lived the circular economy lifestyle myself for a year. I realized that people are changing their behaviors for different reasons. When companies are shifting their business models and when they're shifting how they're uh, interacting and engaging with consumers, it's really important to understand what the needs are of consumers to be able to market the products in such a way that actually is aligned with the needs of consumers in different contexts. To give you an example, I found three different archetypes. This is just from my research, but it was really to elucidate that we have different types of people who are shifting their behaviors for different reasons. One group of consumers I call the occasional enthusiasts, and they're not really motivated by the environment uh, or reducing waste. They're more motivated by saving money or because something is convenient. So they'll go and repair something because it's like, hey, this is really convenient for me to do, so I'm going to do that. Another group of people who I found are motivated by making it a social thing, so they'll have clothing swaps with their friends. They display items that are made out of recycled materials in their homes as a status symbol, so they're driven by status and the social aspect. And then the third group, like the hardcores, who are very motivated by the environment and reducing their waste, to them, the driver was their own personal values as well as being part of the community. Another thing that I found is as people reduce their consumption, they're actually more drawn to communities and being around their neighbors. And that's actually part of um, shifting into circular economy because a piece of it is sharing and being comfortable with sharing. Beautiful. So we've got these three archetypes. I love the way you describe that. I'm wondering, do we have some sense of where the tipping point lies with respect to consumers driving companies, especially the companies that are asleep at the wheel, but the ones that are already understanding there's a major shift here and they've got a massive opportunity to reduce their costs. Do we have some sense of what those demographics, how they split out in any nation? Well, there's certainly a lot of research that's done around Gen, the millennials and uh, Gen Z who are driving behavior both in consumption as well as policy. There's some research that was done out of Delft University 
where they found that people between 25 and 34 years old, when they're voting, their primary decision was climate change. That included especially people of color and climate change was a huge uh, driver for making their voting decisions in the last election in the U.S. We are seeing that. We are seeing just from brands in my work, working in corporate social responsibility and sustainability with different consumer brands, we are hearing a lot of brands saying, oh yeah, we're getting asked by consumers, what is this made out of? People are searching for things that are ethical, that are environmentally sustainable, and are asking questions. There's different initiatives as well. There's one who made the fashion initiative where people uh, are demanding transparency from high fashion brands uh, because they want to know how is this made? What's actually going on? We're seeing more and more in popular media of what happens in Bangladesh and how different workers are treated around the world. Uh, Both ethics and environmental sustainability are are key. Do you think the tipping point is going to come from the group at the front end who are basically saying, look, we've got to deal with these issues, the big humongous ones like climate change? Or do you think it's going to become somewhere from the middle? What's your instinct on that? I think it's coming from different directions. What we're seeing right now in the tipping point, at least in the U.S., just because this is the market that I've been thinking about the most in the last few years. We're seeing a lot, obviously, from the younger generations who are voting. They're voting with their feet. And then we're also seeing the investor community who are now asking for more disclosure because they're seeing risks, right? They're seeing stranded assets and they're saying, hey, we want to start seeing companies disclosing because they're looking to avoid the risk. We're also seeing brands who are experiencing a disruption of supply chain. Actually, part of the circular economy is a strategy for dealing with a supply chain disruption. Because a lot of the times when you're extracting uh, resources, if there are any kind of environmental hazards or any kind of social and political conflicts in a country that disrupts your supply chain. Circular economy is a way to ensure closer ownership to your supply chain. So let's say if you're a manufacturer of laptops, instead of selling these laptops and then you don't know how they're recycled, you actually are leasing them and renting them and you get them back. You can use that material for net new products. So yeah. it's coming from different direction. So, uh, so that, and, that's, and that's a pure expression of a complex system, I, I think. There's no one point that you can push on and say, this is it. It's a convergence of, of things going on. So that's fabulous. Going back to your supply chain point, one of the things I read with the pandemic initially, when I was system-wide shutdown, what it showed up was that supply chains had the resiliency to completely designed out of them. If that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. It's a you know t- tremendous opportunity to go, what do we want to do here? Do we value resiliency? Any thoughts on s- supply chain re- redesign? Yeah, there's a lot of work definitely happening around supply chain redesign because the resiliency, it's around environmental impacts and it's also around the social impact and the treatment of workers. That's both of these things because if people are not, especially people who are working in the developing world are not getting equal payments, they're seeing the breakdowns of their families much harder for them to actually maintain their land. So there's definitely an importance of addressing both environmental and social issues to ensure resiliency. Some companies, so for instance, Unilever, they have been working with their farmers to teach them about water and how to reduce the amount of water. Because again, like if you're growing tea, for instance, and if you're working in a region that is compromised and is experiencing a lot of droughts, then your supply is going to decline and it's not going to be as good quality. So there's a huge need about teaching and working with farmers and with manufacturers to really think about how to improve efficiencies of the resources. The word I'm feeling underneath the surface is care. (laughs) It's just going back to caring about people who are on the land and who have what they have. It's just how do we care about the entire supply chain on every level? It's not just can we just focus on efficiency and forget about what's going on, but to really look more deeply. I know you've been tackling the big stuff climate change being one of them. We've got a list of things called global risks, which in my brain are those highly complex issues that require a fairly high level of collaboration or cooperation in order to co-create some solutions. And the work you've been doing to move from where we are now, which is morphing somewhere between stuck and traditional to edging towards circular, and to handle these big issues, 
what are the transition strategies? The place from here to there is uh, kind of like no man's land in a certain way. And, and people get lost in that zone and get scared and then run back to the traditional because it's nice and safe. A beginner's mind helps you enter into that new zone. What, what are you seeing there? What are you thinking about? What are you putting on paper? And how are you moving this forward? <laughs> Small question. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> that in itself is a complex question. But I guess maybe it's first to call out what some of these issues are and where we are today, because right now we're uh, dealing with multiple crises, right? Like we've got obviously the environmental crises that you've talked about, the breakdown of the biosphere and ecological systems. Then we have a healthcare crisis. And of course, we're seeing more of that with COVID-19. But even before COVID-19, there's a huge crisis in terms of access, equity, comorbidity, mental health. There's a governing crisis <laughs> that we're experiencing. Our governments are designed in such a way that they're just not fit for today's world. They're unresponsive to rapidly shifting reality. They're not really using foresight and decision making and not thinking about future consequences, inability to govern complex system. And right now, especially with technology coming up and having negative consequences. Another one that's cuts across all of these is social inequality and racism. That's really foundational because all of these different systems are founded on systemic inequality and colonialism. So this is where we are right now. <laughs> the good thing is globally, we're starting to see these things as a system. And I think that's what's exciting to me right now living in this particular moment. There's always people who worked deep within these different crises. But I think this is the first time that more of us are starting to see these as interconnected. COVID-19 exposed so many fault lines in these systems that we've been taking for granted. I think it's now really top of mind. And actually it was interesting too, in, in the Biden administration, there's this narrative of these different crises and that we need to really ad address all of them because they're interconnected. I haven't actually heard this before from U.S. administrations. So that's pretty exciting. But this is where we find ourselves today. There is a tool in uh, Foresight called Three Horizons. And Horizon One is our current system, the system that we're seeing in decline. Horizon three is the future desired goal or the future system. We're seeing signals of change that we're shifting towards this uh, future system. And then there's horizon two, which is kind of an in-between. It's the transition system. And this is where the most amount of conflict and uncertainty, high disagreement and tension. I think right now we're in this horizon two system because we know that where we are today is not working. We know that we need something else, but I think there's a lot of tension and ambiguity on how we get there. And even what that new thing, there's still a lot of tension and ambiguity partially because you've got some dominant voices who have been creating this vision for the future and have been omitting other people and have not been including all the different voices. We are in this tension and it's been bubbling up and we are seeing it around the world. In terms of the, the space, how do we shift from where we are today to where we need to get to? For, for change design and systems change, the first part is awareness that there needs to be change. I think we are here now. Uh, we actually gotten this awareness. The second piece is desire to support. This is about what drives us. Why would we want to support the change? Some of us are driven by hope or fear or status or integrity. And because of how we're driven, it actually manifests a different reality and a different desired future. A forum for the future where I currently work, we developed a future of sustainability report and we actually explore some of these mind shifts uh, of how our future could unfold based on these different mind shifts that are all currently happening, coexisting at the same time right now. Which makes it interesting. And we know that when we get into that, that territory of the uncertainty and the ambiguity, it, it, it helps to have at least an understanding of the interconnectivity of all things. Yet we've got these systems in place in business, particularly, and I'm going to hit on that because I think business can lead mm -hmm. and it's missing the, the opportunity, certainly the one that COVID provides. 
there's a real chance to make those systemic shifts. And yet there's so much of a holding pattern built in. Any ideas on how to unlock? We've all struggled with this. Do we start at the self? Is this at the leadership level? Is it a matter of changing the systems and processes? We can get a certain amount of momentum out of that enough that maybe people will go, okay, I'm not afraid of losing control. Any particular insights from your work on that little conundrum? Yeah, definitely. I, I want to start from sharing a quote by a famous systems thinker, Donella Meadows. <laughs> and she talks about, we can't impose our will on a system. We can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than could ever be produced by our will alone. It just really embodies all of the work that we've been doing because it's listening to the system. First and foremost, it's diagnosing, it's understanding what is actually happening today. Where are we? Part of that is bringing in diverse voices, it's bringing in different stakeholders who haven't been at the table to really understand some of the challenges that people are going through. What are the opportunities? Where is the vision? How can we get to a common ground? So that's number one. Then with that understanding, what is the vision that we're trying to get to? And how do we create that with all these different players, how do we develop that common vision for our future? I guess the one thing to note when we think about the common vision, it's going to look different in different areas because context is so key. Another term or another frame in systems is requisite variety. It's really thinking about that we need a nuanced approach to dealing with different challenges. Context is key. Whatever the solution that we apply has to be relevant to that context, but we have key commonalities that be included policies. It could include various technologies or cultures or having some sort of a common goal, but really thinking what would the solution look like and how would it look unique in these different types of contexts. There's the, the, the visioning and then there's the ability that's building capacity. Now that we've got a vision, how do we get there? What would it take? Do we have resources? Do we have capacity? Do we have the knowledge? Do we have the expertise to get there? And if not, how do we make sure we um, link together collaborators who can actually help each other and work together to support? We don't necessarily need to tackle everything in isolation. And in fact, we can't because the challenges are so complex and so big. Strategic partnership becomes really crucial to get to where we need to, especially in a time where we don't have a lot of time. So we know we have to accelerate whatever it is that we're doing. You're hitting on a whole bunch of points and I doubt I'm going to remember them all, but one of them is <laughs> cycling back to diversity for a second. When I listen to those conversations, I hear stuff like it's just a moral thing to do. It's it's the right thing to do as if the colonial arrogance is finally getting down on its knees. But in reality, in these complex issues, diversity is critical to being able to see the way through. So it's not a matter of we should do it or we could do it, it's more a matter of must, must embrace diverse perspectives, regardless of what form that means, mm -hmm. so that we can collectively get through something that really benefits from quite a diversity of perspectives and perceptions. Does that ring true for you in your work? Yeah, it's must and and also for implementation, right? If you are taking a, a top-down approach within corporations and governments, if you're saying like, this is what we're going to do, here's my vision, this is where we need to get to, and then you expect other people to implement who have no stake in this vision, you're going to be spending all this time convincing versus if, if you're bringing these diverse voices to co-create a vision, then there's more likelihood that vision will actually come to fruition uh, because people will be invested and they'll see a benefit to their communities and their families and they'll see how they can contribute. Right now we need people to be invested in you know solving climate change from uh, the webinar that I was listening to this morning. It was a woman talking about deepening democracy for uh, racial uh, justice in dealing with climate change. She said it's a white privilege to think we could talk about climate action with, without addressing environmental racism. Right now it's just table stakes. We can't be addressing issues unless we're also ensuring that we're addressing inequality, racism, and injustice. Now you're hitting on the other part that I was thinking about earlier. I will readily admit I'm baffled by the idea that continuing racism is even an option. Because if you look at what we're dealing with on a planetary level, we've got these big issues. And yet it, we continue to put ourselves down as a species. It's, we think we've got the answers. Let's put this group down and put that group down and suppress these voices. 
we've got challenges here that require everyone to be engaged. This is not a, a spectator sport. It is a full-on engagement for what's possible in the world and how we can co-create it together. I just had to get that in because that's something that bothers me a lot. It's this unconsciousness that we're actually dealing with to bring it up and put it in front of us. But then let's be really mindful about how those two line up. What's the coherency behind, between what I'm acting on and what I'm saying I'm acting on? I think that's going to be a big factor going forward on these issues. Absolutely. I'm seeing that coming up as well. This is the decade of action. Companies are not going to be able to get away with just saying, oh, we're going to do this, putting into policies or putting it into big statements and plans without actually showing what they're doing. And accountability is also going to be crucial. Who is holding us accountable? I think it's citizens. Citizens and consumers are going to be crucial in, in holding companies and governments accountable. And investors. We're seeing more investors who are actually starting to hold companies more accountable. That leads me to trust and transparency. I noticed in the Edelman barometer, initially, people didn't trust the government, they trusted their companies, which leaves you in the place of, of either being elated or worried, one of the two, depending on the mindset of the company and the values and the ethic that it lives by. But when the pandemic hit, the shift went to, it's okay, the government will look after us. People said, we trust the government. That worked in some nations, but not in all, <laughs> as we've witnessed. And so then it comes back to, now what do I trust? So I, I appreciate what just said about the citizen level, because that is where repairing trust, both in information, in stewardship, in decision-making, in how we care for each other in the societies as a whole, that's where there's a lot of healing work to be done, I believe. Mm -hmm. And trust is so crucial for us to move forward, to, to do any kind of work, everything from acting on climate change to taking vaccines. There's a lot of distrust of pharmaceutical companies administering vaccines because of, you know, historical uh, issues, especially towards people of color, uh, black and brown communities where different vaccines were tested in unethical ways. Now, at this point, oh my God, what do we do? We need to build relationships with communities. We need to find ambassadors in communities. It's because that trust has been broken that we're seeing this. Yeah. In certain countries, I believe it's in Taiwan, that their COVID was dealt with so well because trust with people and government has been built over time. And so when government said we need to lock down or there's certain procedures that needed to be followed, people were more uh, willing to listen to those procedures and, and follow those procedures versus in countries like the U.S., there's very little trust towards anything that the, that the government or besides from Trump, he's anti-government, even though he's in government, but from other official policymakers, there's very little trust. I think what you're referring to is the whole political process that isn't positioned to meet the challenges of the day. I think that's probably true for many political processes. So there's very few examples of really good governance worldwide. We've been talking about this in, in a variety of levels. Any thoughts on what people can do? Any thoughts on how to bring this home? But definitely citizens are able to there's things that you could do beyond voting is important. And, and we saw people came out and voted in historic numbers. And now we've got a new administration making change. Citizens can also run for boards and commissions. It does take more time to do that. And there's ways that you can start influencing the system from within. There's also thinking about consumption behaviors. That's a tricky one because in doing the research on circular economy and also li living the circular economy life myself, I realized that there's only so much that I could do as an individual because the system wasn't there to fully support me. Yes, there are certain things that I could do, but it was very challenging to not buy a new phone because I could have bought a brand new phone much faster than fixing my phone that broke. That's actually quite challenging. And this is where I think it has to be um, a whole approach where policymakers businesses and consumers are all involved. Citizens can think about their current position, where they are today, whether they're a lawyer, an economist, a janitor, it doesn't matter. And think where are the opportunities to start conversations about environment, about racial injustice, and how can they use their existing sphere of influence to start creating change? Because there's so much that needs to be done and we need to reach that tipping point. The only way we'll reach that tipping point is if all of us who are activated, all of us who are already in tune with what needs to be done starts activating our uh, networks. Consumers can 
make demands and can also switch when they're seeing a better choice. From a business perspective, it's about looking at all the products and services with a lens of being climate positive. It's thinking about not just reducing your impact, but finding ways to be regenerative because right now our carbon levels are so high that we need to start taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Regenerative becomes really um, important in that uh, sense. There's also opportunities for using design as a tool. As much as 80% of a product's environmental impact is determined at the design stage. So there's a huge opportunity to be creative with how products are designed and thinking across the whole system, both from how we manufacture as well as how we deliver those products. The circular economy is exciting because it, it really looks at the whole value chain and it looks at everything from how do we stop extraction? How do we build new processes for manufacturing using renewable energy that are regenerative, that have no waste and no pollution, and that also engage consumers in different ways where instead of buying a whole bunch of things you don't need, you're actually extending the life cycle of products. You're also using things when you need to. You don't necessarily have to be working in the sustainability space because these issues impact all of us. Maybe you're working at a tech company. That's great. You have a, a platform where you can start talking about environmental uh, justice and sustainability and anti-racism. You can do that anywhere you are in, in your uh, profession or life. Excellent. Thank you. Cassini, anything else you want to add? Forum for the Future recently released our Future of Sustainability report. It's mapping out the different trajectories of how the future can unfold. Trajectories help us with our decision-making. It's basically, what do we need to do? What do we need to think about as we develop our actions or as we're working on our sustainability strategy or business plan? We have a transformed trajectory, which is all about shifting what we just talked about. It's about regenerative design. It's about understanding that the environmental crisis is really interlinked with the human crisis and the social crises and the health crises. Our goal is to shift towards the transform trajectory. And that also comes with a mindset of transform where we're seeing COVID-19 as an opportunity to reset and to rethink a lot of our existing systems and not take them for granted. But there are also other mindsets that we've also seen as part of the COVID fallout. We saw nationalism where there's a scarcity mindset where it's, we, we don't have enough for all of us. So I need to make sure that it's for me. We saw that very simple example with the hoarding of toilet paper. I must make sure I've got mine. That is a mindset that comes out of the fear mentality, right? There's another mindset that we've identified where it's discipline. Greater control is required and it's using potentially technologies to maintain public health and security and to keep global interconnection going as normal. It's about ramping up the use of technology for automation, but that could also include surveillance and control to, to manage complex problems. Finally, we've also identified an unsettled mindset, which is there might never be a new normal. We might constantly be in the state of discontinuity and new things will keep popping up. No normal will be the new normal. Previous ways of thinking are not helpful now. We're seeing this continuous discontinuity from events and crises. These are the four different trajectories that we're seeing that are driven by mindsets. They can unfold and become the dominant way of how the world works unless we all take action to shift the transform trajectory, which is where Forum wants to go. For that report, people can go to forumforthefuture.org and then look for the Future of Sustainability report. It's completely consistent with bifurcation. What do we choose? Collapse or transform? We're in a position of choice. A lot of what I see in terms of action is the assumption that we don't have that choice, but we do. All the power is in our hands. Thank you very much for a wonderful overview. I would highly encourage people listening to go over, take a look at that and just see where your brain fits. Where are you, where, what's your perception? What's your thinking? Where does it fit in, into those four areas? Which one do you, do you feel is the one you want to pursue in order to create the future? Because we are in a design phase. We are in a co-creation phase. 
And uh, the more consciously we co-create, the more intentionally we do it, and the more collaboratively and collectively we do that, the better chance we have of creating a future we want. I think that's a wonderful uh, resource for anybody asking the question now, is there a future with hope or what's my place and how do I develop the thinking skills, the agility to, to step into these new ways of working with the planet, uh, of working with each other of working with the systems like governance and, 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 and economic systems and so forth. Where can people go for more information on your work? My website is aonstrategies.ca. That's my personal website. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Ksenia, for joining me on this program and for the great work you're doing. I'm really excited by it and delighted to be able to have these conversations. I don't get to have these conversations with too many people, so it's really <laughs> sweet. I really appreciated this. I believe that we have the capability, the adaptive capability to change our approach to how we make those decisions. I am Donna Jones. I can be found on LinkedIn at D-A-W-N-A-H-J-O-N-E-S. My work involves helping companies adapt to very complex conditions through decision-making, through updates in leadership, and how we interact with each other in the workplace. Thank you very much for joining me. Kindly share this if you enjoyed it and or give a review.